Hello, and welcome to Cut and Splice. This is Matt speaking, and I'm here with our co-hosts. This is Jason. This is Gil. And this time around, we will be talking about Michael Haneke's 1997 film, Funny Games. It is a originally an Austrian film. It was later adapted 10 years later uh, by the same director as an American film starring uh, Naomi Watts and Tim Roth. Uh, the And they are shot-for-shot shot remakes, by the way. But uh, fundamentally, the plot is a family of three, very affluent, very educated, basically just going on holiday for what they assume is going to be two weeks of boating, golfing, and fun are met by two young men who turn out to be psychopaths and hold them hostage for a night and proceed to psychologically, pathologically, and brutally torture them. That's basically the overview. Um, So uh, since I have some of my strong opinions, I'm just going to kick it over to the other two guys to uh, give their initial thoughts. It's probably important to mention that um, even though uh, you've seen both of them, that uh, we're primarily talking about the Austrian version. Uh, uh, because right. um, while I was hoping to see the both versions before we had a chance to talk about them, that didn't really work out. Yeah, uh, and and uh, just as a, a preface, like if, if I do for some reason make a comment about the uh, the remake, uh, it, it's going to be something about the technical side. I can't stress enough. This is a shot for shot remake. Like it, 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 but anyway, uh, yeah, you guys go ahead and shoot. Yeah. And I think I'm personally happy about the fact that we watched this one. I was telling Jason, because I I felt like the language distance, um, like might distance us from the action somewhat, or it will make us focus on the action and the structure more than the particular or the the, the language, the, the dialogue. Also, uh, and we can get more into it in the second half with the spoilers, but I feel like Naomi Watts and stuff, would, I, I would get like a Mulholland Drive vibe there, I'm sure, with her performance, but I'm, I'm imagining how... Um, horrible and probably was for her to make that movie and then how stressful it was and uh and and i feel like seeing a and i saw that in Mulholland drive so i i kind of feel like it, it was nice to see just different performances from from different actors and um uh, the one thing that really really annoyed me about the movie is that it just drove me nuts that uh one of the 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 dudes just looks so much like Pete Sampers. <laughs> I just <laughs> I, I just could, could not. Yeah, he does. I didn't think about it until you said it, but he does. <laughs> <laughs> that bothered me the whole movie. Like I get why is Pete Sampers torturing people? <laughs> but yeah, uh, but that aside, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I guess like one last question that I would have as far as the comparison. So um, I, I wasn't Michael Pete or something was in the uh, remake. Um, uh, oh, yeah. No, uh, no it, it, Michael Pitt. Yeah. Pitt, Pitt, Pitt. Sorry. Uh, and he he plays um, the Paul. which one of the two does he play? Uh, the, the dominant of the two. The dominant of the two. It's funny because I Sanders. think he looks more like the other one. But I, I guess yeah. in the in the remake, they're both kind of blondes, like dirty blondes. Yeah. Uh, anyways, yeah. So that's that's that. That's funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I guess I guess we should go. Um, so I, I mean, Matt, you you should start. Just uh, I, I know that you have very strong feelings about it. So maybe you should start, and we can take it from there. As far I, as I, uh, I actually agree. I think Matt should start simply because before any of us saw this, he gave us his um, pretty uh, <clears throat> dramatic uh, feelings about this movie. Oh. So it might be best for the, um, <laughs> if anyone ever listens to this audience, to um, you know, to to get the same experience. Okay, so um, 
I saw this movie. Uh, I saw the remake first, and uh, I saw it with all of our mutual friend uh, Andrew uh, mm-hmm. at a little indie theater, and I had already seen uh, Michael Haneke's film Cachet, and uh, it was like, okay, that's pretty good. You know, let's go see Funny Games, and I go in and I watch the movie. And all I could think was, this director hates me, like me personally as a human being. Like th- this is uh, this movie is something that it it's like a catch twenty two that he made for himself. In that, if I hate it, I'm a good person because I hate seeing innocent people needlessly tortured and brutally murdered for entertainment purposes. And if I like it, I feel like the director is pointing a finger and judging me for enjoying watching what he put on the screen. So basically I felt like the entire movie was a middle finger to the audience that was either saying yeah, yeah, you like that, you sex out of a bitch. Whereas my brain was going, no, I don't like this. <laughs> I, I I, don't know what you're expecting of me. And then the other middle finger was to the audience that did like it, in that, well, yeah, yeah, you like that, you sex out of a bitch, don't you? And so I, I went home and I looked it up and I saw, oh, okay, well, this is a remake. Maybe the original was better, you know. Maybe and trying to remember the chronology. If I saw, um, yeah, yeah, I saw the lives of others before I saw Funny Games, and the lead actor, the late great, uh, uh, forgive any German speaking friends uh, who might ever hear this. Ulrich Mühl was the uh, lead actor in the lives of others. And I saw that he was the lead in the original Funny Game. So I was like, okay, I'm going to go back and and go to watch the original and see if there was just something lost in translation. And surely enough, it's a shot for shot remake, pretty much the same dialogue, uh, you know, maybe with some things lost in translation, you know, a few nuts and bolts there, but it's the same movie just done with uh well the remake was done with Darius Kanji as a cinematographer so it looked better otherwise it's the same damn movie and i mean i i was just kind of flabbergasted that kind of an internationally respected filmmaker in Michael Haneke who's made you know Cache the White Ribbon Amour uh well i mean both of those came after funny games you know, like how does this guy not only make this movie, but make it twice without changing anything. Honestly, I, if I'm going to wreck it, it, okay. So the thing is, you know, a lot of people with whom I work are people who work in the horror space. And most of my friends from film school who are really into horror movies, love this movie. They love it. Like it's a 10 out of 10 for them. And for me, uh, well, I'll, I'll save my rating for the end, but I hated it. <laughs> I hated it. I hated everything about it. I mean, I I hated the fact that anybody thought that anybody would actually like it. I hated that. I mean, I would rather watch Hostel 3 than this movie again. And that's why I recommended that we watch it, because we can actually explore how a talented filmmaker can make a, such a piece of dreck. Anyway, uh, so that, that that's, <laughs> that's, that's where I was. <laughs> um, uh, Michael Hanukkah, if you ever listen to this, uh, no, I don't want to work with you. Uh, but anyway. Wow. Um, I, I have to admit, um, Matt, in case you didn't hear this yet, um, I, I heard a, a tiny, tiny uh, little bit of a spoiler from Gil uh, earlier this week that um, that he might have some slightly different views on this so I, i'd love to hear what he had to say about it all right oh so you want me to go uh first yeah yeah i'd love to hear it <laughs> <laughs> yeah i uh, know it's it's tough i um 
the first sign that I had when I was watching it that this might be interesting is, and, and for one thing I'll say, I really wanted to dislike this movie. I really, because Matt said that it's he saw both and they're so bad, I said, like, I, I don't want to be the anti-Matt guy. I'm going to end up being like like the the left or, or actually the right. It's basically like the, the politics in the U.S. now is like that you're all anti the other side, basically. Uh, and and I didn't want to be that way because it's it's often the case. But I think it's mostly just different tastes. And it's just that me and Matt have such strong <laughs> impressions of things. That's why when we're not aligned, which sometimes we are, it just feels stronger than say the difference that I would have with than with Jason on certain movies. Uh, but the first hint that I had was um, the Criterion Collection thing came up. <laughs> No, I was like, wait a second. <laughs> I mean, like, these are like really sophisticated movie fans. Why are they like putting this on the Criterion Collection? It's like, I, okay. I did see that as well, and I went, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and then I mean, I, I, I was like checking out the because I like to be, even though I shouldn't do this when I'm watching movies at home. I, I, I get on IMDb while the movie's going, part of the movie, and uh, I check things like what it was shot on or certain things, and. And sometimes I'll even glan glance at reviews and stuff. And uh, yeah, and, and I saw that it varied, that, that some people actually, some reviewers did have Matt's opinion. And then some other ones just really thought it was a sophisticated movie. So I was looking for both. I, I was just trying to be very, very like objective. And, um, and, and I got to admit, the first 20, 30 minutes or so were pretty frustrating. Because uh, I am not a horror fan. So that's for one. So you definitely know I'm not going to give it a 10. <laughs> um, so I'm not, I'm not a horror fan. And I, I, I really don't enjoy people getting tortured. Some horror movies are basically that. Uh, it's it's really... Uh, that's why I really don't... That's what I don't get about horror. Uh, the only horror I like is suspenseful. Or there's something more to it. Like underneath. And... As the movie went on, and we'll get into it in the spoiler-filled second half of the discussion, I I realized, like, oh boy, this is really sophisticated, smart filmmaking. So, because I saw some tricks, like, even in the beginning, the first few shots, I already saw that he was doing some stuff. But there was, like, midway through the movie, there were some really, like, nice twists, and then I was like, wait a second, this is not just some abusive uh, fuck you to the audience, you're, you're sick people. There's something going on here. Uh, so, so yeah, so I, so that's, I became even more and more interested and attentive. And, and towards the end, there's a few more tricks towards the end that are happening that we can get to. And I don't know, it's, I'm still on the fence as far as, whether I would recommend this movie for people to watch, I yeah, I would say if you're a horror fan, you you could probably watch it and enjoy it. I don't know if you'll get everything that's going on there thematically, but it's it's got suspense to it. Um, it's got some interesting things. Um, and if you're a casual movie watcher, yes, this is not for you. But if you're a a movie buff, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but if you're a movie buff and you like to keep close attention to detail there's something to this as long as you can stomach the um the abuse the the well, one last thing i would say is like as i was watching it i was really frustrated with it no actually i'll save this for the second half yeah i'll because this is like getting into the more plot and stuff that's later on so um oh i i'll get to it but but yeah i want to see what jason thinks um you know, overall view of it I uh, I didn't really care for it that much. I definitely think it was an interesting thing he was trying to do, but I think that uh, what's the guy's name again? H Haneke or something like that. Whatever. Uh, Haneke. Haneke. Uh, I, I, I think. Um, uh, 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 all right. Sorry. Oh, that's fine. If I had to boil it down, I would say that overall, I went into this movie with certain expectations that I, it's nobody's fault. It's just having been Matt's friend and having her had, you know, countless hours and hours of conversations about movies. 
inevitably I've probably heard Matt say something similar to what you just heard him say at least seven times. And so <laughs> I went into this expecting this to be like complete dreck. And I don't think it's, I, I don't think that I feel as strongly as Matt does that it's like that bad. It It is bad though. And what I would say bottom line is that I think that the director was trying to do something very sophisticated and I don't think it succeeded. That's my opinion. I, I think it's really pretentious. I, I feel very similarly to what Matt said with about the catch 22, but I kind of would phrase it differently than what he did. The, I mean, clearly the, I think it it's pretty clear at least that the director is trying to make a comment about like violence and how we as a society like deal with violence and stuff like that. And I think like what Matt said, in a way he's kind of daring you to enjoy the movie. And I think that it's like, it, like what Matt said, it's like a catch 22. If you did enjoy it in a traditional movie viewing experience sort of way, then that kind of makes you sick. And if you didn't enjoy it, the catch 22 part is that all the pretentious filmmakers are going to be like, well, you just didn't get it. And I don't think that's the case. I think he just failed. <laughs> and, and I don't think it's like, it's far off. It's pretty damn close. It's just, I don't think it really works and I can go into more detail as to why, but that's more or less uh, how I feel about it. Yeah. I mean, Matt, I have a question about your reaction to it. Because yeah. you, you say that, don't you feel there's a lot of movies that the fact that they show something doesn't mean they condone it per se. It's no, just that they're not. presenting it to be essentially um, absorbed and, and make of it what you will. But it's it's not as if he condones it. I don't think there's anything overtly that he's doing where he's yeah yeah you like it bitch uh, not not in that sense we can we can talk about specific lines in the movie and things like that um and some of the tricks that are you cinematic tricks that are used but i personally don't think that this movie condones the violence or 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 glorifies it for that matter i don't think that it does well i i, I mean i'm the first person to say that depiction does not equal endorsement. I mean, Requiem for a Dream is the greatest anti-drug movie that you can make, and it has depictions of drug use galore. You can't make an effective anti-drug movie without showing people suffering from their drug use. But I, I have to admit that a part of this, and you know, usually I'm operating in my prefrontal cortex, but this was a gut reaction to me. I, like, you know, first of all, I mean, I I do have to admit that I just felt like I was being judged by the filmmaker to begin with. But beyond that, I mean, again, like, you know, Michael Haneke was never, I don't think that Michael Haneke was ever endeavoring to make either the torture porn fans nor the Stan Brackage fans or anything in between come into this movie and start chuckling when a good person gets tortured. I think that it was mostly a lot of cheap tro tropes of violence that are used in movies. And again, well, and, you know, this is where you can make an argument for the movie, which is, you know, uh, you know, kind of, holding a mirror up to some of the stuff that we take for granted, which we can get into in the next segment. But I felt the entire time like he was torturing me. And as somebody who does think way too much about movies, okay, I actually, you know, I, I, I need to save most of this for the second portion i i yeah, it's, but, it's tough not to get into the uh yeah, the, we can just it's, talk yeah. about it it's fine i mean it, but, we don't have I don't no no, no i mean we, we, we can get there but but, yeah, yeah, but yeah, let's but, let's, but, let's but, finish but, it but, off then the but, the okay, as far but, as recommendation okay, but go but, ahead go but, ahead but, well actually yeah let me just make a broad statement though 
Yeah. I think that the thing that bothered me was that he was trying to paint a cheap torture porn movie in a veneer of filmmaking craft and relying on a certain amount of cachet, pun intended, <laughs> to elevate it from where it was into the you know upper echelon of thinking film goers who are going to sit here and analyze it and make something more of it than what it was. <laughs> oh, cache. I get it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> because of the movie. Um, yeah. I mean, I pretty much said that I, I would really only recommend it for horror fans because it is essentially a horror movie and sophisticated moviegoers. Yes. Uh, Cause if, if you watch this movie just on the surface, uh, and you mostly get annoyed by the cinematic devices that we'll get to in the second half, then you're it's it's not going to be an enjoyable experience. But if uh, if if you're interested in that and you want to keep an eye out for the things that happen, that also can be annoying. but if if you try to understand why they're done, then it, it kind of shows you how you can take torture porn essentially and make it, an art house movie in a way it's it's uh, a way to do it it's it's more a more modern way for sure that he's doing it but it's it's doable uh whether i would recommend this movie it's 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 not it's not fun <laughs> in, in, in spite of the funny in the title uh it's uh. not a fun movie to watch and it, there's probably many many other movies that are worth watching before this one but since i was obligated to see it for this i i saw <laughs> value in it <laughs> so so, um, yeah, I mean, as far as uh, my my rating for it, it's really tough because I really wanted to give it a six or less. But but I got to for the sophistication, I have to inch it into a seven. Uh, I, it's I'm very much on the fence. I, I think it's a it's a seven for me, but I understand why other people would rated much lower because they're looking for something else when they're watching the movie. And I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it didn't grab them the way it grabbed me, but but I'd still, it's I'm not endorsing it as like oh this is a great watch. I'm just saying that there was enough sophistication there to give me a a nice meal of a movie. Um, a, as a movie fan, as someone that's really interested in the craft and the grammar of cinema, it gave me more than a lot of movies I've watched recently, which is something. Hmm. I don't know. I guess uh, I I thought it was like um, it had some some moments that I liked. Um, some like choices, uh, like the, the certain shots and stuff. Um, I'm actually having trouble remembering them right now. But yeah, I, I think um, like I said, and obviously we'll get into this later more. But like um, I. I feel like he was going for something and I don't really feel like he achieved it. And as such, I'd probably say it was like definitely not the worst movie I've ever seen. I've seen far worse than that, but um, maybe like a, like a three or something. Wow. Right. That's, uh, that's going down there. <laughs> now I'm curious what, what not rated it. Uh, well, I, and you know, I, I, I have to stress this, uh, stress this point. You know, like, I mean, I've seen movies that are, I, I can say, are objectively worse than this, like, just from a filmmaking standpoint. Right. But, That's what I was getting at. Yeah. But were, they were what they were. You know, like, I would recommend Jingle All the Way over Funny Games to most people. <laughs> Jingle All the Way has a couple of funny moments. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a good comedy. So, uh, so um pretty terrible ending yeah uh original i give it a two remake i give it a three because of kanji okay wow that's crazy i i wonder if i can get that low with if i've ever seen a movie i just don't see too many bad movies i i i wonder if i can ever give a movie below a five or a four it's got to be mm. a pretty pretty bad movie but, I could recommend some really bad ones at some point. Yeah. No, maybe I should revise my 
maybe I should give this movie a six and just revise a lot of my ratings and I, I should go into the fives and the fours and the threes more often, I guess. But yeah. it's it's all good. I mean, that's that's why we have these discussions. That's it's the fun of it. So we're like seven, three, and a four. Uh, uh, oh, seven, two. Three, you're, two. You're a two for the original, right, uh, Matt? Yeah, it was a two for the original, a three for the the remake. And but Jason I, is a three. A three. Okay, two, three, and a seven. Oh, that's a pretty big gap. Yeah, yeah let's get into it. Let's <laughs> <laughs> bridge that gap. I mean, I guess if, if I met somebody and I, um, after speaking to them, I got this feeling that they would really appreciate something about the movie. Yeah, I'd probably recommend it, but um, I'd probably recommend it with some, you know, some warnings. <laughs> like, I don't particularly like it, but based on what you're saying, I think that you might blah, 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 blah. And it's very, it's certainly a very interesting, you know. The, the the guy definitely tried something. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> if I met a uh, a sophomore film school student who was really into Lars von Trier, I would recommend it. Oh, that's a good point. Yes, yes. Uh, what I, what the uh, what was the who was the person the the one who, the... any sophomore uh, film student who was so into sophomore film student. Yeah, well, who was into I, a Lars film von student. Trier. A film yeah, student, I would recommend seeing this because you're trying to study the craft. It's that's uh, a good point. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. Uh, but particularly somebody who's really into Lars von Trier. Yeah, yeah, no, because his movies are torture too. Sometimes, I yeah. mean, uh, right. on purposefully sometimes. Yeah, and, and I mean, Lars von Trier re referred to himself as a cinematic masturbator. So I, I yeah. mean, that 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 seems uh, cogent. Yeah, no, um, he's definitely self-indulgent. There's no question, but he still makes pretty I, I good movies. Get, I don't want to get sidetracked here, but I'm glad you brought that up, Matt, because <laughs> I've been sitting here as we've been talking at, in the back of my brain. I've been trying to think of movies that I really, really didn't like, like, like that I hated more than this, like I really, really hated, you know, like something that would be far worse than this. And I was like, oh man, my experience with um, Antichrist that might have been a movie that I really hated. But then again, that movie had a lot going for it that this one doesn't. So I don't know, whatever. Anyway, just yeah, you know, throwing Christ. that out there. Uh, it's a good one. I wonder if I ever rated that one. Uh, that's got to be a four, at least for me, for that one. <laughs> that's a bad, bad movie. Um, that's a really, that, that was a tough movie. Oh, God. I, 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 the, I remember bloody you guys out. <sighs> yeah. Ah, anyway. I give it a six. I give ah! it a six. <laughs> What? I'm telling you, it's pretty rare that I give less than a six. All right, you need to watch Mortal Kombat Annihilation. That's yeah, I probably to. do. I probably do. I remember that one. Like, uh, did I see it? I think I saw it. Mortal Kombat. Uh, anyway, of really bad um, uh, movies in the last 15 years that were like considered parodies, but were like really bad, like epic movie and stuff like that. Those would probably be lower than six for you as well. This yeah. is the curse. This is this is the curse of having IMDb be like even a part of our adolescence to early adulthood, where you're constantly rating everything on a one to ten scale, uh, and you don't want to be the you you don't want to be the ass who's like just rating everything a one, or like the fanboy who's rating everything a ten. So even if you hate the movie, it's like a five or a six. Uh, no, if you hate the movie, it's a two or a one. If you're meh, it's like a five or a six or something. But you know, it's uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, uh, what, what? I gave it a two Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Ah, see, it's a pretty bad movie. There you go, it's possible. Right. I'm not sure if I've ever given a one, but uh, yeah, I gave a two. That's probably my yeah. lowest rating. I don't wow. know why I'm being stupid. I can actually go through my ratings list and just go to the to the twos, and you know, then I can see. Like, see what I've rated that low. But in any case, we're being sidetracked yeah, here. Yeah, that, yes, yeah, that, yes. Yeah, that, that, that doesn't uh, sound like good radio. Um. So, uh, so, spoiler, uh, so to the spoilers we go. Yeah. Um, so what were, I'm curious to know, Jason, what were the parts that you felt he was going for but didn't completely succeed? 
I mean, I don't know if I'm going to be able to explain this very well, but like, like I said, that in my opinion, that's kind of what I felt like he was going for. What I mentioned earlier, I feel like it's a statement about violence and our society and how we deal with it and, and don't deal with it and stuff like that. I would not call this. I, I would call this movie a failure because I think if you're going to make a movie like that, you need to present the violence and you need to present everything and kind of just allow. You need to create a movie that says something and then allows the audience to talk about it and come to some sort of conclusion. I don't feel that this movie does that. I think this movie kind of like hammers you over the head with its point. And it, I don't think there's any room for the audience to interpret anything or to think about it and try to come up with their thoughts on it or anything like that at all. I think that a you could kind of take everything that's in this movie and do it a little differently. And I think it's possible to come up with something very introspective and very uh, thought provoking and whatever. I think the stuff that kills it is how ridiculously pretentious a lot of it is. I, I do like that they were actively trying to subvert the expectations of like normal horror movie type stuff. I don't even know if the director would consider it a horror movie. You know I mean? Like from the way he kind of did stuff, it was almost like he was trying to make a, an anti horror movie or something like that. But I don't know. Anyway, I think that, so, okay, just to throw this out there, the violence, we kind of talked about this a little bit, but I'll just throw it out there. All the violence in this movie, the, the really, really terrible stuff happens off screen. And there are movies that do that very well. Uh, that Joaquin Phoenix movie, very recently that came out the you were never really here or something something like that yeah i'm trying to remember i think it's like it's you the, were never here or something like yeah, that yeah, you were never, yeah. yeah lynn ramsey the lynn yeah. ramsey movie yeah that's a movie that's very violent but it's it doesn't spare you the violence it just very very creatively takes the most horrific moment and happens to do it with something in the way or just off screen or uses the editing to kind of, it doesn't even, it actually doesn't soften the blow. It just, it manages to do something to make it less gratuitous and more, I don't know, provocative or something more effective in some manner. It's hard to really grasp what that movie does. This movie, I don't think achieved that. I think this movie, yes, it doesn't, literally big spoilers here doesn't literally show the child's head getting blown off but it's like uh let me let me describe what i felt with this like one of my favorite things about that whole the stuff leading up to that scene families being tortured uh psychologically mostly not not physically uh in the living room peter the the more dominant of the two crazy guys is like oh it's my turn to go get food and he goes into the kitchen and he starts making a sandwich. Meanwhile, the other guy is kind of playing a, a, a different words, but like I, I would assume it's like a German version of eeny, meeny, miny, moe uh, mm -hmm. to decide who he's going to shoot or something. And in the, in the sound that's going on, you can hear a scuffle happen or something like that. The gun blast goes off and... It's it's actually one of my favorite scenes in the movie because the uh, the Peter character doesn't even seem to react to it like he is so not concerned and I was thinking like holy shit did they get the the gun from the guy or it doesn't sound like it it sounds like there's still something crazy going on over there or whatever it's like he doesn't even care he's just putting his sandwich together he didn't even stop getting his food ready then he walks into the other room and you see the aftermath of what's going on and it's. And that's when you finally, you don't even see that really. You see the TV with some blood on it and like whatever, like that's the kind of shit that I don't think works. It, it's kind of like he's showing so little that at, at there's moments of confusion because you don't know exactly what happened. And then there's moments of confusion as to what their motivations are based on the way they're acting. And, and there's little to no... I don't know. I, I almost want to say satisfaction, but that sounds kind of sadistic to say that. But like, if you're good, like, like what Matt was saying earlier, uh, if you're going to make a movie about something with a statement about something, you almost need to show it. And this movie is making a point not to show it. 
And I think that uh, if you're going to try to make that point, you kind of need to show more than it did. I, I don't think it's effective in that sense. Uh, it's more frustrating than it is effective mm-hmm. at, at making its point. So all that stuff really bothered me. And then, of course, you you follow that scene up and it's like he's got the, uh, a fucking 10 minute like static shot following that. And it is so not Norman Bates cleaning up the mess in in Psycho. It's not there to like pad your emotions or to help you through something. It's not there. I, I don't know. Maybe it was trying to make a point. I was just like, let's get on with this already. Either kill them or do something or say something about this damn movie. This is just going nowhere. And, and I mean, you're talking about what happened after the, um, the, TV? Oh, yeah, sorry. That's after they like, left. Bloody. Yeah. After they yeah. left. There's a 10 minute after... shot. Yeah. Oh, that new, yeah, the ten minute shot of uh, the they're like scanning the room that they're yeah. showing the aftermath. Oh no, 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 not that. Well, I, it might actually be the same shot. I'm not sure. But, no, that, um, yeah, after, the, the bloody after TV, they... and then oh, right. you see the you see the kid with the head blown off, like, yeah. but it's in a white shot because yeah. he doesn't want to make wide. it too graphic, and the uh, the you see that the wife is in shock. Yes. So she basically doesn't move yeah. for like a period of like it almost looks like a freeze frame for a while until she starts it moving, does. and then it slowly like but that. surely she starts moving. Yeah, yeah. and uh, to I me that was a, like a really powerful shot. But, but again, I think we were like in a different all that like, story. You you could do it in close ups. You can do it. You could let the actors no, really. No, no, yes. no, no. You don't because no, this is not filmmaking one hundred and one. If you don't want to glorify something. You keep it at a distance or you don't show it. That's the whole thing. The main thing that I don't understand is this movie is not about violence. That's not what the movie is about. The movie is about subversion, subversion, uh, um, what's the word? Subverting Subverting (laughs) expectations. It's it's actually not violence. No, life. It's about life. It's about also movie making. It's about storytelling and life. It's about subverting your expectations. It's from the get-go. The, this movie, it has violence in it, but it's a device to tell a story uh, about expectations. I don't think it's per se exploring violence and violence in the culture and this is what we like. I got none of that from it. And and I'm not sure, this, this is why I'm asking these questions because I'm trying to see at what point in the movie it got triggered in you that that's what the movie is about because i i really don't see it like i i I don't see what everything in the movie hints to me okay Uh, yeah go ahead okay so i agree with you that it is about subverting expectations but you can make a movie about subverting expectations with any plot this is a movie about subverting expectations with two psycho killers torturing a family all night long and it is a movie and you want to know where the point is, where it starts getting like where we feel like the director is, is toying with you and not, not actually, you know, all right. It's the bullshit third wall or fourth wall breaks. It's the bullshit talking to the audience. It's the bullshit remote control thing. Like, that's not subverting expectations. That's masturbation. That's bullshit. Like you can make a movie like this for for one thing. If it's if if it's not also about violence, if it's not subverting our expectations about all that stuff and directly relating to violence, you can make this about uh, you know ab- about a, a sports team and and how there's tr- there's filmmaking tropes of all sorts of genres that we have complete expectations about he decided to make it about psycho killers coming in and and torturing a family there's definitely some intention there behind it it definitely has something to do with violence now we can obviously discuss about w- how much of that was necessary or what was it intended and not intended or whatever but the the fact that it's so self-aware and that self-awareness isn't helping. It's not, it's not doing like, like in the, in Deadpool, 
it's helping the comedy it's helping the character it's helping us as the audience enjoy the movie this is not helping his point you can make this movie and make it about subverting expectations you can make it about violence or make it out of anything else whatever you can kind of do the things he was trying to do and make a movie that's not a like sluggishly paced and difficult to watch you can make it a little more accessible and a little more like um uh i don't definitely not enjoyable but um uh clear you know and also just like like i don't know matt was kind of getting at the whole um the disgusting nature of this like the the character you know just like toying around with you as the audience with, with the you know, I don't know. I'm kind of going in a circle here, but I think that that stuff, the well, the fourth the, wall breaks and the, the remote control. Yeah, yeah. so the fourth shit, wall, I was going to respond to that. I think that's the bullshit. Quickly. That's what I think. I, I do I, agree. I, I do agree that that was the riskiest device that he used was the uh, the fourth wall. When he when the first time he, he broke the fourth wall, I was like, ah, no, we're not going there. Please don't tell me we're going there. And it pissed me off the first time. Like most things in this movie pissed me off until I understood what it was doing and then I appreciated it. And I realized that there is really no other way to do that unless you use that device. And the rewinding of time, again, it's, I was like, oh no, no, that's like, no, that can't happen here. But then you're like, no, but this is what the movie is about. And there's really no other way to, to, to and it starts from the beginning. What happens in the beginning, and this explains why it's about violence and why it can't be basically everything about this movie, if you think about it, it had to be the way it had to be. It, it told itself based on what the premise was. How does the movie start? It's a family going to a holiday, a recreational yeah. holiday in a serene lake, right? Which is what most people like. What's sure. what's the most calm thing that humans do is leisure time and a, and a vacation home. It doesn't get yeah. more serene than that. And that's what most people would choose to do if, if they could have the freedom to do that. And what's the worst thing that can happen to a human being? Being tortured and killed. So that's the movie. It cannot be told any other way. If you If you're trying to juxtapose... The best thing that can happen to humans and the worst thing that can happen to humans, that's, this is what you have to work with. These are the two situations you have to work with. And he shows that in the movie. The, the, he explains it in the first scene. They're in a car, and what are they doing? They're playing funny games with listening to classical music, the yeah. most serene, calm music in the world. And what happens when the credits start rolling? It's death metal. Yeah, that's the movie. That's what the movie. It's juxtaposing the best case scenario with the worst case scenario. So this is the only way for the movie to happen. And and then throughout the movie, what happens? Uh, the 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 first trick that I thought was really cool that really just blew my mind was when the kid goes runs away and goes to the uh, neighbor's house, and then you realize, oh my god, they're dead. Like the, 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 they're not their friends. And I didn't get this at first. And I was like, and then I remember the first scene where the wife says like, hey, she didn't wave to us. And then I remember the guy, the, the neighbor coming with Pete Sampers <laughs> to uh, when he comes when he comes through the gate and he doesn't speak. He doesn't talk very freely. And then I, I'm thinking about the scene on the lake with the wife and Pete Sampers meeting their third the third, uh, you know, like um, the future um, yeah, victims. victims. Yeah. Um, uh, like, so I, I'm like, oh my God, this is great stuff. Like the, the fact that he planted those seeds, but I didn't catch them right away. But then when once the kid saw that the house was empty and nobody can save him, you realize that, I mean, they're essentially serial killers. And the one sin that this movie made is that it, once that happened halfway through the movie, I kind of knew that the way the movie was going to end is that they're going to go to this third victims. I, I that part I kind of knew. I just didn't know how it was going to end with the family. And and then when he started doing the whole fourth wall, it pissed me off, but I was I was with it because I was I already saw some good stuff. So I was like, so what is this? Like yeah. why is he doing that? And and then I try to understand, okay, so this is a movie. He's making you aware that it's a movie. He wants you to be aware that this is a movie. 
and what happens in movies. And that's where the rewind comes in. In a movie, if it's not a tragedy, usually what happens is like at the last second, like close to the end, something happens and and the, the protagonist somehow pulls it off and is able to kill the bad guy. And that's what happens there. And then he says like, oh, no, 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 no. And he's already told you I'm in control because I was speaking to the audience. I'm in control. So he gets the remote control. He rewinds it and he has it happen his way. The point there is he's juxtaposing. He's making you realize like, oh, wait, uh, Mr. Audience, fuck you. You're not in a movie. You're in real life. Like what this movie is, is real life. In real life, this family would have zero chance of survival. They would be brutally killed. But I wanted to show you that what movies show you is that uh, there's always a chance. It's in the last moment. She'll grab the gun. She'll kill one of them and, and something will happen. But you don't get that. Like, and, and I, but I want to show you that that's a possibility only to rewind it and to remind you that what I was doing here is that I'm, I'm, I'm showing you real life juxtaposed with movie like the movie world with the movie life so th that's all the stuff that was happening there and and it's it's good stuff whether or not it's an enjoyable movie to sit and watch it's not it, it's not super enjoyable but the fact that he makes this larger statement about all this juxtaposition of bad with the good a movie reality versus actual reality it's how many movies do that? That's that's sophisticated filmmaking. That's that's. I'm glad I saw it for that reason. I I probably wouldn't have seen it otherwise. This is why we do this show because we can, <laughs> you know, find these things. And it's like, oh my god, I would have never like watched this movie if it wasn't because all I heard is from Matt. It's just shit. It's shit. And, and I was like, I I don't have like some sort of. Let me just watch all the movies that Matt doesn't like, just so I can <laughs> like them and explain why I, I like them. No, it's just that I I, I saw these things and and they spoke to me and I kind of got them and and I and I thought it was really impressive. I, I wouldn't have thought of that. That's really sophisticated filmmaking. Whether it's successful, I guess we're going back to the whole this whole the whole way this show started is tenant. Uh, whether it's actually enjoyable moment to moment, maybe it's not. But do I appreciate it? Am I glad this movie was made? Is this the reason why it's on the Criterion Collection? Probably. <laughs> uh, I just think uh, I, I agree with you about a lot of the things you said. Maybe it's because I obviously read the synopsis and it says you know to. Uh, or a family of three goes on vacation and then is terrorized by uh, in their own home by two, uh, you know, uh, crazy guys or whatever. They, I don't remember exactly how it's worded. I, I'm, I don't know. Maybe this is because I, perhaps I watch more horror movies than you do or something. I don't know. But in the opening scene, when they, when the, the husband and wife are looking out the window and they say, who were those two young guys and why were they acting weird? I immediately at that moment was like, ah, oh, shit, the neighbors are fucked. The neighbors are getting tortured and next they're going to be at their house. Then they did get to their house. And the moment you see, um, it's not Peter. What's the other, what's the real crazy guy's name? The, 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 uh, okay. The, the lead, the lead psychopath uh, is Paul. And oh. by the way, uh, Gil, the guy that you keep calling Pete Sampras, his character's name is Peter. So Wait. Oh, that's uh, that's that's awesome. I yeah. thought it, I thought it was the other way around. But anyway, whatever. Uh, anyway, yeah, well, wait. the one who gets the eggs, the the one he keeps calling Tubby. Uh, uh that dude. One, yeah, uh, Tubby is Peter. Paul. Oh no, but so, no. So Paul, Paul is Pete Sampras. Yeah, he, Paul he is like Pete Sampras. He does look like Pete Sampras. <laughs> uh, but uh, the the Tubby guy. Uh, uh, the second he's sitting there, God, that uh, guy's acting is great. Or maybe it's just his face. I don't know. But like the moment he's at the screen door trying to talk to the wife about getting eggs, I was like, that dude is deranged. That guy's yeah. like, ooh, and the, it's the gloves. I think it's the gloves. Great, great choice when it comes to the whole uh, costume department. All I was getting at is that I get all the stuff you were saying, Gil. I still think that there's a way to take everything in this movie and make it substantially better without any of that fourth wall breaks without that remote control scene without any of that shit 
I actually think, especially when it comes to subverting expectations, the setup of the knife on the boat, which was so obvious, and then them not only not being duped by it or not her being unsuccessful at the end, that's only part of it. The fact that they are mid-conversation and they decide, we're done with this. Let's move on. And they just kill her very unceremoniously. The camera doesn't even cut to her point of view while she's dying. So, like, that's definitely subverting expectations. And that was very clever and smart. I yeah. just think you can do this movie without the bullshit. I think that stuff dragged the movie down. And, and, and it's not just that. It's a lot of the stuff in this movie I found very pretentious. And unnecessarily so. Like, it's it's risky, risky to buy devices, but show me that movie. If 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 somebody can make that movie, that's great. But until then, this is unfortunately the best version of that kind of movie that is available. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not denying that a better movie could be made about the same theme. I mean, a lot of movies repeat the same theme, but well, I, me, I've never rephrase. seen a movie like this. Let me so. rephrase. I think regardless of somebody else could make a better movie i think this movie would be far superior to itself without that shit i'm saying I, I, that's that the thing i'm not sure so what would you down have done? into the mud i but, would do it i i could make but, this but movie if he doesn't talk the to the camera without yeah. that and it still makes the point no but if he doesn't talk to the camera he can't rewind the the tape and if he doesn't rewind the tape he you still can't have make all the... the subverting expectations you still have all of it but but he was trying to make a the point about the reason why this movie is so depressing and difficult to watch and by the way the reason why it's it's tough to watch is because it's another thing like tenant and memento and he's trying to put you in the shoes of the family like right. he wants you to yeah, suffer true. through the movie so you feel what yeah. the family is going through in a way to relate to them. But I, I think that you don't get that. You, don't, you, you can't, in that case, there's no catharsis to the movie. The catharsis of the movie is that you don't get the catharsis, that you had it, it was close. But because it's not that kind of movie, uh, it had to have this uh, alternative ending type of thing. It's like It shows you, oh yeah, this is, could have gone this way if this was a movie, but we're presenting to you real life. And real life sucks, it's horrible, it's suffering. That's basically what the movie is saying. And I don't think you can do that without the rewind. And if and and I don't think that without breaking the fourth wall, the rewind would be even stupider. I'm well, not denying I, that, that it's agree. not. Yeah, well, of course, yeah. You, you can't do one without the other, that's for sure. Oh, well, I mean, if you did, it would be very bad. <laughs> because he has um, to establish that, hey, look, we're in a movie, I'm talking to the audience, therefore, if I grab the remote, it's plausible that I can do this. Yeah. Otherwise, no, it doesn't I, work. I was just going to say, though, like, I don't have any examples of other movies that have attempted to tell this story. So not not that. But specifically with the idea of what you're you're talking about of so you're saying, you know, movies do this, especially horror movies do this, where you got this situation, it's terrible, but then somehow they manage to pull out something at the end, blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, there are a lot of horror movies that end without the final girl making it. She doesn't always survive. And uh, a lot of times there are really, like there's a lot of horror movies out there that pro i don't know this would be a better like thing to talk about with somebody who's seen hundreds and hundreds of horror movies i like horror movies but i'm not like a an aficionado or anything but i think a lot of movies i've seen actually end where it's just ends on a tragic like oh the bad guys managed to kill everybody and nobody got away and blah 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 and a lot of times they're not great movies, but they it's been done, you know, it's been done a lot actually. And uh, I don't think any of them were well, maybe some of them were trying to make a statement like this that like this is real and this is what real life is like and stuff like that. But um, I don't know, I just I think um, for me, I, I just don't think it really works. I mean, I I thought the scene at the end was clever, I don't think I felt any catharsis at all. 
No, not during the scene. Uh, it's just that it, it explains. Yeah, this, this is like I said, it's the, it's the worst part of the movie is that it, it becomes obvious that once it's not completely obvious, like a lot of movies, it has a diversion because he kind of says, I'm hungry. <laughs> Uh, like that's why he kills her off because he's just hungry. He's tired of yeah, this family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wants to move on, but he's not actually hungry for food. He's hungry for killing yeah. more people. But you know, obviously, there's food in people's kitchens. That's what they eat and stuff. Sure. But uh, so it's hungry for both violence and and for um, for food. But yeah, it's the, the worst part of this movie is that it's midway through it. Once you realize what happened to the first family and how it was set up cleverly then you know once they're done with the second family there's going to be a third one and and yeah. and and when you know that they're not getting away with it once he does the remote thing because that was the catharsis that was the non-catharsis um it, it it was it was showing you like yes in a movie you're supposed to have a catharsis but this is not a movie like this is real life it's a representation of of real life and it's depressing, but at least we're presenting it in a cinematic way and showing you the alternative options to to just explain that this is not this is not funny at all. Like life is not funny. It's actually very depressing, but packaged this way, it illustrates that point. If you just have a horror movie where everybody dies and there's no point being made, obviously that's a bad movie. This is not a bad movie. It, it might not be an enjoyable movie, but it's not enjoyable for the right reasons. It's just that, again, if you can't enjoy a movie by appreciating what it's tr trying to do and having the moment to moment still be difficult, it's supposed to be difficult because you're trying to relate to this family as being tortured, then then yes, yeah, so it's not that movie. It's not the movie for you. I'm okay watching a two-hour movie where it's it's... I probably wouldn't want to experience it again. It's 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 it was a pain, but at the end of it, I felt like I had a very decent meal. Like I really felt like, wow, I, I saw something. This was different. This this was daring, and and it wasn't a, it wasn't it wasn't a home run. I didn't rate it a ten, but boy, I mean that's that's cool stuff. That that that's all I'm saying. But but I agree, it's not an enjoyable watch. It's not supposed to be. That's, you know, it's uh, it's not a Tarantino movie where the violence is spectacular. It's it's no, this is hard stuff. It's shitty and it's a long take after the kid brains explode and and it's suffering because life is suffering. It's not that it's not the movie that you're looking for. It's not a horror movie with the suspense and the this and the that and last minute they get the. No, it's not. This is real life and it it's horrible. <laughs> Well, I'm glad that I recommended a, a movie to you that uh, you haven't seen that you like a lot more than I do. Uh, I don't think I've uh, spoken in the last. I was going to say we yeah. should let Matt go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty rare that me and Jason go at it, but uh, it's good. It's good stuff. Um, but I, I mean, well, okay. To take Bill's side on a couple of these things. My okay, word. So... <laughs> All right, so uh, Peter and Paul on that la uh, on that last scene on the boat with Anna before they unceremoniously, as you put it, just push her aside, kill her, you know, all done. Leading up to that, uh, I, I don't know if I'm remembering the the remake better than I'm re uh, than I'm remembering the original, but I think the the thrust of the conversation was the same, and that Peter was talking about like this conversation between uh, reality and fiction. Uh, oh, uh, I was reading into that. I, I was just kind of ignoring it though. Go on. Uh, and, and Paul just has some kind of a line in like, well, then the fiction is reality too. And Peter is, you know, well, what really are you saying? Well, well, you're seeing, you're seeing the screen just as well as you're seeing me right in front of you or something like that. Yeah. So I thought that that was pretty clever. I, 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 I do give the movie points for that. You know, it's one of those things where you've got a movie and I, I mean, I thought it was really weak up until that point. And then you'll watch that and like, you've got a, you've got a quick line or two and they're trying to kind of sum up 
why yeah. can't you just watch what you just watched? The problem is I don't really, I don't buy it entirely. Uh, but, I, and maybe, maybe this is an issue more for me, uh, rather than, you know, where, Oh, also, by the way, to, to take Joel's side on this, I loved the long methodical takes. I loved those. I, I, I mean, it, especially in the remake. That said, one of the things that bothers me, not only in this movie, but in a lot of movies, is I think that it's a really cheap trope to put a child in peril. Okay. You know, like, that's just a really cheap way to get the audience to be like, oh, shit, things are going wrong. You know, oh, oh dude, just don't hurt the kid. Just don't hurt the kid. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's kind of like, it, you know, it's the same visceral reaction that we have when, you know, a dog is in peril. And obviously they kill a dog in this movie, too. Yeah, very early on in the movie. Like, they, <laughs> right. they basically tell you early on is like, this is going to be fucked up because yeah. uh, like, what yeah. do they sell like, in screenwriting? They tell you don't don't kill a dog because you lose <laughs> the audience. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. American but... gangster. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Josh Brolin killed two dogs in two movies in one year. Oh yeah, and, uh, yeah. American Gangster and No Country for Old Men. Uh-huh. <laughs> but it's one of those things where, okay, you look at Newt from uh, Aliens. Yes. And I still think that that's a little bit of the child in peril trope, where. You know, it's just kind of getting a cheap, visceral reaction out of the audience. You know, like, you know, oh, geez, it's this poor child, and there are these horrifying creatures, and you know, everything is just focused around the peril of this child. Uh, 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 but I think it's it's handled with more elegance there, and I think that Funny Games had a miss opportunity there in. It sh- if you're going to point a finger at the audience, which I really do think that this movie did, with the breaking of the fourth wall, I think it comes with the breaking of the fourth wall, with the lead psychopath, talking to the audience. You know, isn't that what you want? You know, the, you know, the story, the climax, so on and so forth. Don't you want this to play out? You know, yeah. He also it, says, you know, uh, don't you want it to be feature length? Right. You know, he's talking to Which, us. funny enough, it's like an hour and a half when he says that. I'm like, we're exactly a feature length. <laughs> yeah. they, not to derail yeah. what Matt was saying, but uh, I did look up IMDb yeah. trivia. They said it said exactly 95 minutes. Yeah. I, with uh, with Lee, uh, with um, Paul looking directly at us, you know, it, it, with that breaking of the fourth wall, with that finger being pointed at the audience. I, I think that's where it crossed the line for me, first and foremost, in that I already understand that it's just kind of a cheap suspense trope to have a child in peril. I already get it. I think most people, at some kind of a gut level, if not an intellectual level, get it. And now you are subjecting this child to torture like unspeakable psychological and physical torture and yeah they do cut away when he finally gets his head blown off kudos to the filmmaker for not making us watch that no i mean he doesn't make us watch her getting naked too i mean he purposefully avoids that because it's not about violence like it's not about showing off the violence no 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 but but I'm not talking about violence. I'm talking about peril. Those are two different yeah. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for sure. <laughs> and he definitely, I mean, like, he, you, you hear the kids squealing. You know that he's in pain. You know that he's in agonizing pain while he's got the, the pillowcase draped over his head. You don't see what he's doing to the kid precisely. You just know that the kid's in agonizing pain. And I mean, this, again, maybe this is just a visceral thing. Maybe I need to start firing up my brain a bit more the next time I watch this, if I ever watch this again. 
But you probably don't need to. <laughs> but I didn't feel anything other than disgust. Not not at the people torturing the child, but at the filmmaker. I, I, and and the thing is, we can buy into this whole subversion thing. Oh uh, well, this is all supposed to be a, a, a sub- subversive, uh, you know, caricature of how we view, you know, the good and the bad in life, but through the lens of cinema. And you know, this is why he's you know pushing rewind on the uh, on the remote and everything like that. Even through that lens. It's just something where I just don't understand what the hell he's trying to tell me by subjecting me to this. Especially, well, actually, I, I, I think I do know what he's trying to tell me. Again, like I said earlier, that you're a sex son of, a, son of a bitch if you do like it, and you're a sex son of a bitch if you don't like it. So I, I again I'm trying to understand though cuz uh, just before I even forget to ask you said that the moment that you thought the finger was pointed at you is is when he breaks the fourth wall and says don't you want to get to the conclusion how is that pointing the finger at you I mean I I, I thought it was kind of clear I mean it, it, it well don't you want don't you want this huh Huh? Uh, No, not don't you want more violence is is obviously this is insufferable images to watch. You want to get to the end of it. That's what it's saying. It's not saying don't you like this violence. There's nothing in the dialogue that says that. No, you're you're pointing you're putting words in my mouth. I didn't say don't you want more violence. You're saying don't you want this to draw out but i i mean don't you want this to no, reach a conclusion to uh but, to, and, but, yeah but but, I, but that wasn't the only time that he broke the fourth wall uh yeah I, but I, what I, did he say in the other times i, I i'm just trying to understand because to me but, he said don't you want to get to the conclusion because obviously the audience wants to get to a catharsis it, it wants to get to the end it wants the the protagonist to overcome the challenges that's the expectation that is never met but that's what's what he's breaking the fourth wall about. He's not saying like you sick motherfucker, you're liking this. Like you want me to rape her in front of you too? You're gonna love this shit. No, there's nothing in what he says is suggesting that. It's just saying that you you want to get to the end of it because this is really it really sucks. Like it's not enjoyable to watch, but we're spending this time together for a reason to make a point that. Suffering sucks. Violence sucks. There's nothing glorified about any of this. But through the power of movies, you get to experience this for two hours and then hopefully never revisit it again. That's, it's actually kind of crazy to me that you did watch both versions because I see no reason to watch both except for like maybe the cinematography differences. But um, but yeah, that's that's what it's doing there. There's nothing there about pointing the finger. And by the way, I don't think you're wrong. I've seen reviews where where critics have, have had, had the same impression. So I don't think that you're wrong to... I just don't see why that was taken that way by some people. Well, I, I mean, I'm generally in favor of, uh, you know, the Al Pacino playing Vincent Hanna in Heat, you know, I say what I mean and I mean what I say, but, and, you know, breaking the fourth wall, you're kind of thinking soliloquy, but if that's your goal, like actions still speak louder than words. We're watching this person like eviscerating three people, just, you know, torturing them for the hell out of it and turning to us and saying, "Uh, yeah, Oh, well you want this to, come to a certain you know oh you know there there's there there's sub there's this thing called subtext (laughs) and i think there's a a a certain subtext to those little soliloquies that maybe i'm seeing maybe it doesn't exist but i i mean i i i'm just not taking it at face value coming from a psychopathic murderer I think the idea that he winks at the audience with the thing with the dog and then he says those few lines, it's that he wants us to feel captive as well. Like he puts the bad guy in control 
not in the same way that, say, Alex in um, Clockwork Orange talks to the audience. That is more in relating to the suffering of a horrible teenager. But but in this, he is not sympathetic in any way. He is a horrible psychopathic serial killer. But by being in control, like by being in touch with the audience, by being able to remote control, rewind it, we're trapped just like the family. That's the only point that any of those moments make. They don't say anything about the the audience being sick, about violence being disgusting in our society. None of that is is I, I didn't read into anything like that there. All that I understood is like, oh fuck, he's in control. Like he's in complete control. He's the only one that can speak to the audience. He can rewind the the tape. We're fucked. We're fucked and this family's fucked and the family after that is fucked. But that's all I read there as far as what the device was doing. I, 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 but but again, I, like I said, I, I saw a critic reacting the way that you did. So it's not that there was something there that made it. I, I'm just, and I guess I'm just not buying it because I, I saw it completely differently. It's exactly what it was supposed to be doing. And I think Jason's explanation, I accept more that it's just was a shitty device and maybe you could have used a different device that's less polarizing. Let me let me uh, give you an example. I, I, I think that in plenty of movies, they manage to communicate what you're saying. And even in this movie, there are moments like when, for instance... Uh, when they're not using any of those devices. There's moments when they have taped up the hands and feet of the wife. And when the um, the chubby guy goes to the kitchen, he's mm-hmm. talking and he's saying stuff. So we, we know without seeing him that he's preoccupied and they don't cut away so that you get this tension that starts building and building as she hops over to the very, very injured husband who starts biting at the tape, trying to get her free. And it gets closer and closer and closer to her getting away. And we, as an audience, think that she's about to gain some level of control, but he comes back and and just with, he doesn't get mad. He doesn't do any of the things we would expect him to do. He just goes, why are you doing this? You're going to make me hurt you again. Oh, blah, 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 blah. And it's like the whole scene as the audience, you feel like, oh, you feel so let down. Like, oh, man, whatever. That is an example of that working. The, on the boat, when they, at the end, where we're, we've all agreed is really clever, where it's like she's got the knife, she starts doing the thing. It's even more clever because they're having this existential conversation that kind of relates to the movie and blah, blah, blah. What do they do? Do they look at the camera? Do they do the remote control thing? No, no, no. He just, he notices her. He says, hey, go stop that and be careful because you can't swim, which is another moment of us thinking maybe she's going to push him off and then it's going to be a one-on-one thing. No, it it's, it's so good at what it does because none of that happens. And they just, as we said before, unceremoniously kill her. And then the movie moves on. And that's kind of like the whole point and all this stuff. You could make the whole movie that way. You don't need any of the bullshit. And that's my problem with the movie. Because of all that, and on top of the rest of the way he made the other th- scenes of the movie, I think it what could have been very clever is really pretentious. pretentious. And uh, it just killed the movie for me. So that's, so I guess, and we can try to like wrap this up here, but, but, so, but we still haven't solved the dilemma. How do you make the point that this is a statement about storytelling, about movie versus reality? If you, if you remove the devices and all you do is the, ah, she's almost got it. No, they're in control. Ah, she almost got it. They're in control. That's a frustrating movie with no point. It's this just is a pretty a, frustrating movie that you have to really dig to get to a point. <laughs> and I dug and I dug it. Uh, but that's the thing. But but without those devices, all I, I'm left with is it's it's a it's it's got some nice tricks there, like the whole thing setting up the first family that we didn't know that were they were kidnapped as well. But we find out later on that that's what was going on, and they're serial killers basically. Aside from that, if if you don't use those devices then it's really just one tone. 
They're always in control. Well, to, to they almost lose question, control, but they don't. Yeah. To uh, she never how, gets the gun. She never it, kills one of you them. You use dialogue. That's how you do it. Like the way they did in the last scene. In the end. You're, you, but you're again, using but, dialogue between characters. And in doing so, you're communicating to the audience what you're trying to say without actually just speaking directly to them. I, I got to take Gil's side on this one. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, just fundamentals. You know, I, I if you can show it, you you never say it. But um, well, them staring yeah. at the screen is saying it. It's just another way of saying it. Right. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I mean, again, I, I don't like the... No, the, but but also the, the, the last thing, yeah. the existential discussion about story versus reality, where's the story part? Cause, uh, or where's the reality part? Because if all we see is the movie and the fourth wall is never broken, the movie is never rewind. So so you're never going to this postmodern thing of we're in a movie. Then that point is not, it can't come across because it was never established that we're in a movie. As far as we're concerned, it's the reality of the world that was created. And if okay. they're talking about story versus not, uh, the only way that would work is if they wink at the audience in the end. They okay, break the so fourth the wall movie, in the end somehow. The movie Scream is well, yeah. is not just a horror movie, but it's also a it, – it's it, in its own right, it's a great horror movie, but it's also a deconstruction of slasher films. It's a commentary on slasher films. The two villains – never break the fourth wall. They never do all that stuff, but they introduce them as the kind of characters they are. By the third act, they are talking about movies and giving you basically what the, the deeper meaning behind this movie is without doing any of that stuff. They are, they are both showing and telling, and they're doing it in a clever way. That is how you make this movie. You do stuff like what's in the last scene on the boat. You do more of that. You cr you change the kind of characters that the two guys were so that it gives you a plausible reason why they're talking about certain things throughout the movie and you manage to make a good movie out of it. I don't think that you need any of the Deadpool bullshit that works so well in Deadpool <laughs> but not so well in this. Yeah, and and I think I think it's just a matter of it's, it's a it was a polarizing device. I felt like it was necessary to to make the point, but but you feel like it it wasn't. And I'll give an example. I I think The Shining, The Shining is a is is a, a good example of a, a movie that that felt like it was almost about movie making in a way. It was making you aware that you're watching a movie. But it, but it didn't break the fourth wall. There, there's a few moments where Jack Nicholson looks at the camera, but but then you realize he's looking at another character. Mm. But um, but yes, that that's a movie that is. And there might be some other examples. That maybe that's easier to find examples of movies that make you aware that you're watching a movie, but but they don't break the fourth wall. It's yeah. just tougher to do. And and I feel like it, he just wanted to go out there and kind of go nuts and um, and and really do something daring and the result is that half the people hated it and and thought it was hokey and the other half was like that's amazing. I've never seen that in a movie and and done for the right reason as far as at least the perception of it. But yeah, um, oh, because you know, um, like I said, Woody Allen does it for laughs, and, and you know, and, yeah. and um, I mean, I think, uh, yeah, Clockwork Orange, he looks at the camera, I think, too. It's uh, yeah, but I yeah, think there's I, plenty I of reasons to do that in movies. I just don't think that this will work for me. Um, I, I definitely think that you've said some things in the, this last hour, or whatever that we've been talking about, that I didn't think about, and it's definitely making me feel a little higher, a, a little uh, more favorable about the movie, but. Overall, it just didn't really work for me. I, I will say this. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean anything. I just feel like it's worth mentioning because we're talking about this movie and everything. Uh, today's what, Thursday. So yeah, yesterday I got home from work and was tired and I started watching this movie and I knew I was tired and I was like, all right, I got to give this movie a fair shot. So I went and made popcorn. I got a soda. I made sure I was comfortable, but not too comfortable. I started watching the movie. I'm like, I know there's subtitles, so I got to make sure I'm awake for this. And I fell asleep. I totally <laughs> fell asleep in the movie. And I woke up and I was like, what the hell's going on? I don't understand. So I stopped and I just went to bed. And then today when I got home, I was much more awake. 
And I was like, I rewound all the way back to before I knew I fell asleep. And I started it like again at about the 35 to 40 minute mark and watched the whole movie again. And, and I, I honestly was like, this movie's got a lot of the same problems as like 2001. It's like, it's very, very slow and boring. And there's plenty of movies that I love that are slow and meticulous and have static shots and, and, and unbroken uh, shots and long oneers that are not, you know, dynamic oneers and stuff like that. And I don't know, just in general, I just don't think I really dug the movie that much. Yeah, no, and there's nothing, like I said, there's nothing wrong. It's usually there's a reason. And what I said about Matt too, that, that he, that he wasn't the only one that had the reaction. So <laughs> it's not, it's as if it's, there's something personal that he took from his own psyche to make that happen. There, there's oh, yeah. something about that, that, that just, and some people had that reaction, but yeah, I guess that's what's cool about movies that the the polarizing ones can really, yeah, can really, and like you said, especially if you don't, if if you're not on the on the, like we said with Tenant, like if if you're not getting on the thing, like of what what the movie is is going for on board, then every scene is just more and more torture. <laughs> it's it's more and more <laughs> frustration. Um, um so it's um. Uh, yeah, and I really wanted to dislike this movie. So, uh, you know, better luck next time. Maybe Matt can bring some other uh, suggestions. <laughs> Speaking of which, one last thing I'll say about ratings is that uh, I did check it in Mortal Kombat. It's the lowest rated movie I've ever rated, and it was a two. Wow. So, Okay. Cool. Um, I, I have not seen any of the Annihilation. other movies. Oh, of course, Annihilation. Annihilation, yeah. yeah not, not the uh, the original one's pretty good. Yeah. No, no, the original one's horrendously bad but it's it's, know, but it's still a movie. compared to the second one yeah yeah matt i know you said you've seen some i don't know gil if you've seen it I, I have not seen any of this guy's other movies where would you guys place this on a on compared to his other films i mean i i've only seen a more uh the white ribbon and um cachet so fourth, four times as much as me like <laughs> distant fourth. so yeah okay but well, I'll say this. Uh, I mean, be happy, uh, Jason, because I watched a more and I fell asleep. So, <laughs> and and a lot of people love that movie, and I, I should watch it again. But um, but yeah, Is it, it was about just love? yeah, I guess so. This is about Alzheimer's, but um, but yeah, no, it's um, it's very very slow and and has no violence in it, I believe. <laughs> so so. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's a statement about funny games that the violence keeps you up. No, but I, I would have, I would have fell asleep in funny games too if if I was watching it late at night or something. So, I no, was just tired from work. Yeah, yeah, but but um, it's a very slow movie. But someday I should give it a chance because because that one is like I think it won the Palm d'Or or something. It's uh, mm. so I, I guess there's something there. I just need to really be alert when I watch it next time. Matt, where where did you place his other three people? Like, what's his best one you've seen? Probably the white ribbon, but okay, yeah. So he does make okay movies. It's just that funny games is, uh, yeah, hmm. and, uh, yeah. And uh, again, it just kind of flabbergasted me that not only did he make a movie that I hated, but he made it twice. <laughs> yeah, and, and didn't change anything. Uh, uh, there, but, there's something to. Uh, I mean, that might be another talk that we can do sometimes. Is is polarizing movies. It's yeah. uh, what is it about them that the ones that just kind of go one way or the other? There's no in between. Um, um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you guys something real quick. Um, or it, well, uh, again, I, I don't know, um, Gil, how many of his films you've seen, but um, this just stood out to me about um, you know five minutes or so before we we jumped on. I, I wanted to glance at a couple of um, reviews just to see, you know, what the overall take was. I was really surprised that the audience review on this thing was so high. But um, uh, then again, you know, now that we've discussed it, I can kind of see why. But um, I wanted to ask you guys, because this one stood out to me, really jumped out. It's like a guy named Ed Gonzalez for Slant Magazine said this. And I was just, this is like something that speaks about his other films. So I don't know, because I've never seen any of his other films. But um, he's talking about the director's work himself. Uh, Haneke, is that his name right? I, we said it earlier. I can't remember if I'm saying that right. But it said oh, his... Hanukkah. 
Hanukkah. Sorry. Hanukkah. <laughs> like Hanukkah. Yeah, like Hanukkah. the like the holiday. Yeah, like the holiday. Yeah. Um, no, Hanukkah's. No, no. He just said that his movies. He says uh, his, Hanukkah's uh, snooty admonishments are disturbing because they're never self-critical. And I'm wondering, do his other movies have these like? Would you say that his other movies have as much of a direct message that this one does? Because that when I read that, I thought to myself, "Oh my gosh, does this guy have like a like a history of making these like really statement like movies?" You know, uh, I didn't really see that with a more. Uh, I mean, Gil can chime in, but. Uh, it, no, I, it's, it, it seems like a more was more like David Lynch doing straight story or <laughs> or uh, or Elephant Man, um, more straight story, but 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 just basically doing like a straight drama with just a good attention to details and character, but but not really going nuts, you know. Yeah, one thing I was gonna say, I, I, I it's amazing I didn't say this earlier, but one thing when I was watching the movie, and I was thinking of ways that I would relate this to other movies is what frustrated me early on about this this movie is I was uh, we've seen ex- examples of families being attacked and uh, there's like straw dogs as yes. an example of a movie where is the op- it's that's the movie that's the movie of funny games what happens when you push uh, 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 an average person to the limit he pushes back that's what that movie is about um, yeah. This is the movie where the pushback never happens because it's not a movie. Um, so, so in a way, I, initially I thought I was going to use that as an example of a movie that did it better. The idea of uh, you know being attacked mm-hmm. violently and having to to defend yourself. But then by the end of it, I realized that like oh that's this movie is it's not better than Straw Dogs. Straw Dogs is a more enjoyable movie to watch. Yeah, Straw Dogs it's is got, really good. It's got catharsis. <laughs> Um, yeah. But um, but but it, it's actually making a more sophisticated point about the human psyche just because it it kind of skirts both. It, it shows you like, yeah, you've already seen Straw Dogs. I'm showing you what it would be if if it wasn't a movie type of thing. But yeah, in Straw Dogs, I felt like it's a good um, that would be a good like double feature. <laughs> maybe it would be at the New be. Beverly or something. It'd be great. Uh, that's a horrible like uh, double feature. It'd be great if I had never seen this one. This would this would be a, a great thing to see in theaters after having seen or no right before having seen Straw Dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>